Okay, so let's uh, talk about some of the challenges in machine translation. Not surprisingly, all of the problems I've described concerning ambiguity in the last few lectures have direct consequences for the machine translation problem. And in fact, ambiguity is one of the main problems you know, or main challenges to translation systems. So here's the first example. These are examples of lexical ambiguity. And these examples are taken from an article by Bonnie Dore and others from 1999. And several of the uh, examples on the subsequent slides are taken from this same paper. So if we look at a word like book in English, it has two quite distinct meanings as illustrated by these examples. So if I say book the flight, it is a verb and it has one meaning. If I say read the book, it is a noun and has a quite different meaning. And so for many languages, if we try to translate book into uh, another language, we will end up with different lexical choices depending on which sense of book is actually being used. This particular example is Spanish. So under book the flight, we'd get one um, translation. Under read the book, we would get another translation. And so translation is essentially going to require us to resolve this lexical ambiguity between which of these two uses of book is actually being used in a particular context. That is well known to be a difficult problem. There are many other examples. Let's look at this third example here. So um, here I have kill, and actually in both of these cases, kill is actually a verb. Um, and so we have kill a man versus kill a process. They're somewhat different senses in English. Uh, you could argue they're similar, um, but they're really rather distinct senses. And certainly, again, if you go to Spanish, you will end up with two quite different translations for these two different senses. So the bottom line is, in many cases, to translate accurately, you will need to resolve these kind of lexical ambiguities on the source language side. Another challenge which we've described actually earlier in the course is uh, that languages, uh, different languages have differing word orders. And so I'll just give a brief recap of that argu this argument that we saw uh, a few lectures ago. Uh, so if we consider translation between English and Japanese, English is systematically subject verb object. So I can say, for example, the dog saw the cat, whereas Japanese is predominantly subject object verb. So I would say the dog the cat saw. So these are simple examples. Here's another one. But when we get to longer sentences, we um, see that these kind of word order differences lead to really quite complex differences in word order uh, between these two languages. So again, for accurate translation, we're going to have to model these differences in word order, and that can again be a challenging problem. Here's another example from the article by Dorotel. Um, this is an interesting property where you can see that syntactic structure is not necessarily preserved across translations. Different languages can express concepts in fundamentally different ways. So here we have an English sentence, the bottle floated into the cave, and here is the Spanish translation, and here's actually a paraphrase of that translation. So you'll see that the translation literally is the bottle entered the cave floating. And so what's going on here is that the verb floated has in some sense become this essentially an adverbial modifier. So floating is an adverb modifying entered. And um, this into preposition is in some sense being translated as entered, or it certainly has a strong influence on the choice of verb in this case. So you see kind of the verb becoming an adverb and the preposition having a strong impact on the choice of main verb of the clause. So there's not necessarily a direct correspondence between the syntactic structure of these two translations. That again can pose uh, major challenges for translation systems. Syntactic ambiguities not surprisingly cause problems. And so this is another example from Dora et al. Um, it's a bit, little, uh, bit of a grim example, but it's John hit the dog with the stick. There are two possible analyses here. Um, John could either be using the stick to do the hitting, or the dog could actually have the stick. So there's a prepositional phrase ambiguity here. 
we could have either of these two attachments. And on the Spanish side, we'll actually get two quite different translations depending on this attachment. So um, in the first case, if with attached to hit, we get this sentence here. And if with attaches to dog, we end up with a different translation. So short story is that we will, in this particular case, to get an accurate translation, most likely have to resolve this prepositional phrase attachment ambiguity correctly. So here's another example. This is an example where we need to resolve pronouns to their reference before we do translation. So pronoun resolution was a problem I spoke about, I think, in the very first introductory lecture for this class. Let's go over this example. So in this particular case, I have an English sentence, the computer outputs the data, it is fast. And this pronoun it could potentially refer to either the data or the computer. Two possibilities in this context. It's very clear that it refers to the computer in this particular example because it makes a lot of sense for the computer to be fast uh, it makes much less sense for the data to be fast and so pronoun resolution is the problem of taking a pronoun like it and deciding which noun phrase in the context it refers to in this particular translation into Spanish it is then translated as s okay so now let's look at a second example so it's the computer outputs the data it is stored in ASCII. Again, there are two potential noun phrases that it could refer to. And in this case, it's very clear from the context that it refers to the data because it makes sense for the data to be stored in ASCII. doesn't make sense for the computer to be stored in ASCII. Okay. Now, notice in the second case, it is actually translated as a different pronoun in Spanish, estan. So why is that? Well, in this first case, s refers to a singular noun phrase, and so it's um, translated in this, this sense. In the second case, it refers to a plural noun phrase, and so we get a different form. So basically, to be able to translate this word it correctly into Spanish, we are actually going to have to first resolve which noun phrase in English it refers to, to decide whether the noun phrase it refers to is plural or singular, and thereby to choose w one of these two different pronoun forms. So again, this is a problem with ambiguity. Um, these sentences are ambiguous. At least we have to resolve where these pronouns refer. And depending on these disambiguation decisions, we end up with different translations.